his beloved second home at Warm Springs, Georgia, the body of Franklin Delano Roosevelt moves on the first stages of its journey to his final resting place. Scores of sufferers from infantile paralysis sorrowfully bid farewell to their great friend and benefactor. The president's dog follows his beloved master. Aboard a special train beginning the 24-hour trip back to Washington, the 31st President of the United States leaves Warm Springs forever. And all along the 700-mile route, people gather to honor President Roosevelt and his ideals. Slowly the train backs into Union Station in the United States Capitol, awaited by a military guard of honor and members of the late great chief executive's family. With Justice Burns and Secretary Wallace, President Harry S. Truman heads the assemblage of the nation's leaders. On a six-horse field artillery caisson, escorted by representatives of every branch of the nation's armed forces, the casket passes grief-stricken throngs of people en route from the station to the White House. Warplanes pay a final tribute to the fallen commander-in-chief, and officers and men of the mighty armed forces which he led march in slow, measured tread in Franklin Roosevelt's honor. from the White House in Lafayette Park, the men, women, and children whom Franklin Roosevelt served so well watch in tearful silence. Just before the brief private White House rites, President Roosevelt's casket rests in the historic East Room. Here, 80 years before, lay Abraham Lincoln. Now, home again, to the garden of his family home in Hyde Park, New York, comes President Roosevelt. Here in the old and lovely Hudson River estate, which several years ago he bequeathed to the people of the United States, the mortal remains of a man whose career has known no parallel in our time will rest forever.
nation and the world mourn with Mrs. Roosevelt and her family. S. Truman, President of the United States, distinguished senator from the state of Missouri for 10 years and vice president since the last national election, Mr. Truman brings to his new high office an understanding of the gigantic American war effort, second only to that of the late President Roosevelt. Climaxing a long record of senatorial leadership, as chief of the famous Truman Committee on War Production, his work was a vital factor in the vast allied war effort. At last summer's Democratic National Convention, Harry Truman was chosen as candidate for vice president with President Roosevelt. His brilliant record, hailed at the convention, included leadership in legislation for the Reciprocal Tariff, for the Selective Service Act, for Lend-Lease, and the repeal of the Neutrality Act. In 1935, he had voted for the World Court. And he had consistently given support to the progressive social program of the Roosevelt administration. Returning to Washington with Mr. Roosevelt, Harry Truman was now the vice president-elect. In his first speech after his inauguration, Vice President Truman said, in this shrinking world, no nation can live safely alone. Peace-loving nations must band together for the preservation of human progress. As President Roosevelt's second in command, these words expressed the American program. Franklin Roosevelt, born to wealth, and Harry Truman, one-time farm boy, were firmly united on that and every other major world aim. As the nation is plunged into mourning by President Roosevelt's death, Harry S. Truman becomes president, the seventh American vice president to assume the office under similar circumstances. President Truman takes over his duties. He announces that the San Francisco conference will go ahead as scheduled and immediately receives the nation's military leaders, War Secretary Stimson, Army Chief of Staff Marshall, and Fleet Admiral King. James F. Burns, High Roosevelt aide who took part in the Crimea Conference, Secretary of State Statinius, British Foreign Secretary Eden, and Ambassador Halifax also visit the President. Arriving to address a joint session of the Congress, President Truman receives thunderous applause. He pledges to carry forward the work of Franklin Roosevelt. With great humility, I call upon all Americans to help me keep our nation united in defense of those ideals which have been so eloquently proclaimed by Franklin Roosevelt. I want in turn to assure my fellow Americans and all of those who love peace and liberty throughout the world that I will support and defend those ideals with all my strength and all my heart. So that there can be no possible misunderstanding, both Germany and Japan can be certain beyond any shadow of a doubt that America will continue the fight for freedom until no vestige of resistance remains. Our demand has been, and it remains, unconditional surrender. We will face the problems of peace with the same courage that we have faced and mastered the problems of war. In the memory of those who have made the supreme sacrifice, 
in the memory of our fallen president, we shall not fail.